So welcome to A Course in Miracles Workbook Lesson 153. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. Now, this is again one of the most important transcendence lessons in A Course in Miracles and as a whole in the non-dual understanding. Now, even non-duality is a paradox in terms, because why say non-duality? It infers there's duality, and duality is dream. It's not real. It appears real, it feels real for the dream character, but in truth, there's only oneness. So why do we say non-duality? Well, because it's a term commonly used in spiritual circles or ascendant circles. We make use of those terms. And I, I posted something on, on, on the group today about a, a, a video by Rupert Spira, and he makes a statement, there's no radical teaching other than silence. And there is nothing more radical than silence. And even silence is a concessionary step towards, again, another concession, awareness. Um, and as you know, I've used awareness and consciousness very differently consciousness to me is consciousness of the dreaming character mind and awareness is what we progress to as seeming separate body minds we progress in awareness and what is awareness it's the essential essence the, the essential nature of the essence we are we are pure energy pure essence and what appears, what is, is the appearance of activity in a dreaming mind. And although the dreaming mind is real, the activity of the dream is not. And so that which dreams is already perfect and is the extension of source energy, source essence. And we, the dreaming characters, the illusion of ourselves isn't true. Yet the essence of ourself is, and it's the self-same essence as source energy. And so what awakens, nothing awakens really. The essence, which is source, is always awake. Its extension, which we call the sun, is awake. In truth, yet it appears to dream, which is in real, can't dream. It's just a temporal glitch, a little in the energy of that which is. And that's about as close as we get to trying to explain anything. Because in truth, the closest I get to getting rid of what I'm not, the more you realize you don't know anything. Because there's nothing to know. So you can't know anything. And, and truth itself as itself cannot be known by an activity that appears to dream. So it gets paradoxically complicated. But there are steps and techniques and guidances which make the living as a body-mind in the world, in the dream, easier. Forgiveness is one of them. Why? Because you learn to forgive and not hang on to the grudges and the resistance. And another one is defenselessness. Now, I will use myself as an example in this case. I grew up in a war country. I mean, at the young age of six, we were you know, we left Mozambique as refugees, watching a war, atrocity, war atrocities, which in itself had been created by colonialism so the the, the 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 recourse of colonialism was the locals said no more um and then we came to south africa which was steeped in apartheid and that in itself was a transition for a young man to awaken to that and got sent off to a war um which i didn't want to partake in but it was either that or go straight to jail and don't pass go and as a young man, because of being darker skinned, a foreigner, a refugee, 
classified as non-white by ignorance. What's more white than a person comes straight from Europe, European, Portuguese? But the, the locals were just in such fear of any change. And of course, the country was changing. So the bullying, the, the, the physical attacks, fight or flight, two types of people. And I'm the fight type. So what did I do? I skilled up martial arts. I learned to defend myself, self-defense. What happened? I became a national kickboxer, national a springbok kickboxer. Now, never mind all the separate skills, the firearms, the special forces stuff. What did I do? I skilled up. I was the perfect defense weapon, which, what do you do with a defense weapon? You use it to attack. And so I was, I believed I was a good person, but I was always geared up for the fight. Tina Turner, we need a hero. And he needs to be strong and he needs to be fast. He needs to be ready for the fight. Well, I was that. And what did that mean? That meant that I attracted the wars towards me. I attracted the fights towards me, the gun battles, the physical fights. And I was the good guy. I always couldn't believe this was happening. Why would, the, why would people want to attack me? And, and then go on top of it all, go and pick a person with skills, which meant it didn't turn out very well for most of them. And and attack and defense and defend. And that was became a spiral, a downward spiral. Um, and people are like that. I mean, around every corner, you'd find an arsehole if you believe the world is filled with arseholes, a souls, a type souls, arseholes. And, and good guys come last, and you have to fight for everything and put up walls. And before you know it, you become rigid. On the outside, and you're still soft as putty inside because that's the true essence of self. When I read this for the first time, I was already in a transitionary, transitionary stage of my life, awakening through forgiveness into the reality of the I amness. So there was a preparation already taking place. But when I came across this sentence the first time I read this back in 2010, I think it was. I, I struggled with this lesson, yet once it became absorbed, accepted, believed as a better way, this is one of the better ways, my life changed 180 degrees for the better, became gentler, the conflict stopped, the war stopped, the attacks stopped conflict situations ended literally overnight. So it's not an easy lesson to accept, especially if you find yourself in continuous battle. But if you, if you rise above the battlefield with awareness, clarity of mind, realizing what this sentient energy appearance is doing by vibrating defenses it naturally at attracts attack because we attract what we resist the universe which is the activity of our dreaming mind doesn't give you what you want it gives you what you believe in what you're feeling and what you're vibrating at and so it becomes a magnet to the exact thing that you're resisting and what is self-defense or defense it's resistance to so you who feel threatened by this changing world, changes are the only constant in the illusion. It's twists of fortune and it's bitter jests like a clown. It's a joke. It's brief relationship. And even if you're madly in love with someone and things are perfect, one of them dies first. Or people betray you. People that feel unhappy inside, they're never worthy, that emptiness is inside, they have no choice but to betray you. You go for the next best thing, climb the ladder. You get betrayed. It's brief relationships. And all the gifts, it merely lends to take away again. Attend this lesson well. And the interesting thing about this world is we often use synonyms of, you know, a free gift. What do you mean a free gift? A gift is free. Why do you have to say a free gift? 
It's because the world gives gifts that are not free. They give you a gift and there's always a cost involved. We say, even say things like, never a good deed goes unpunished. You give a gift of goodness and it always fires back. That's the world of illusion. And I learned that lesson of the hard way because I grew up with this, this spiritual belief that I'm there to serve and help others. And no matter how much you help others, they're never really grateful. So you, if you expect them to be grateful, you're going to be disappointed. And even when you get to that point of not expecting them to be, to be grateful, you'll still be surprised when they turn on you. Why? Because people want to control everything, especially those that are out of control inside. So when the emptiness rises into awareness, they lash out and project their, uh, their unhappiness at whoever's nearby. And then they try and control everything because they're out of control. And yet the more you try and control, the more out of control you become. Because the more you take on, the less you have for self. And the minute you have nothing for self, you burn out and the world just seems to pile on to you. The world provides no safety. It is rooted in attack. So anyone that has the idea that we came here as souls or spirits to play and enjoy the landscape, clearly in a, in a, in a transi tran transitory stage where that soul's come to play for a little while and now they think that's what it's all about. This world was made in vengeance because we forgot what we were and we wanted to prove to what we imagined, not to God, not to the, because if we had remembered God, we wouldn't have wanted to prove anything to him. We would have, if we had remembered God, we would have remembered ourselves, and we would have had no vengeance. That when we fell asleep and fell into fear, sin, and guilt, the idea that the founding foundations of our dream state, we then wanted to prove to our imagined God that we could usurp his power. If we had remembered our source energy, God, we would have known what we were, and we would have instantly woken up. And yet the dream seems to take 16 billion years. It hasn't ended yet. And in truth, because there's no time, we did fall asleep and wake up. So it sounds paradoxical. That's so why I say you can never try and explain it properly without some form of concession. And the most radical truth is silent stillness. And even in this world, there's, no, there's nothing such as silent stillness unless you go into one of those I think it's called a hyperbolic chamber where you sound deprivation and people just go mad there. The world provides no safety. So don't be surprised or disappointed. Why can't it supply, supply me with constant happiness and safety? Because it's made in vengeance. It's what it's, it was what it was made for. It was made for fantasy to escape the reality of the eternal love we are. It is rooted in attack. And all its gifts of seeming safety are illusionary deception, guns, weapons, bulletproof, all of the stuff. You just attract, you build a big wall around your house, electric fence, and you're just basically advertising to all those that don't have that you have something they need. It attacks and then attacks again. No peace of mind is possible where danger threatens us. And once that programming is kicked in, once you believe the world is a world of, an, of attack, where you have to defend yourself and protect your family and your loved ones, it becomes that. Look at religions. Religions, especially the Christian religion, believes everybody's out to get you. And yet, who's attacking all other religions? Right. The world gives rise, but to defensiveness. It gives what you see is defensiveness, layers upon layers, that hide the light we are, the essence, the light of awareness we are. For threat brings anger. Anger makes attack seem reasonable. Honestly provoked and righteous in the name of self-defense. And you hear this in, in, in religious circles, righteous anger, righteous vengeance. The Lord, you know, the Lord said it's right to take vengeance. And let's go and attack people. You often hear people you know, we're praising the soldiers. Oh, soldiers have come home. You brave soldiers. Wonderful. It's wonderful that you praise brave soldiers that have come home. Where were you? Where were you attacking what? Oh, they were defending your country in another country. If you defend your country in another country, you're attacking the sovereignty of another country. 
Yes, but we attack them first so they don't attack us. Are you sure about that? Self-defense is at least on your own border. Self-defense is not flying across the ocean to another country and attacking another country. And then you claim they're terrorists. You're being the terrorist in their country. And that's what the world does. This is what war is. This is how the world has grown. It started in Central Europe and there were the, you know, Africa and there was the Indians and there was the Inca. And, and what did we do? The, uh, the greedy little pioneers went and conquered. And if they resisted, then we attacked them. My own forefathers built wooden boats and, and, um, and found the world and designed the maps and uh, conquered, conquered. And then, and then they're surprised when shit happens. Why? Because if you attack, attack begets attack. And then you say, oh, I'm going to do selfless, right, self-righteous defense. Well, well, good luck to you, because the minute you build those defenses, attack, attack, defend. And so it's, that's it. You're now stuck. And if it's triggered at a young age, it becomes the rest of your life. And if it's triggered at a late age, you're like, it's preposterous. How can this be happening to me? And generally, you, you crumble. People that have had an easy life and they get attacked in their 40s and the 50s and 60s fall apart because they've never had to fight out of the streets. And that's why in my own personal illusionary story, I'm so grateful for the tough upbringing, the radically horrible upbringing, because it, it toughened you so that you could cope with whatever comes up. Then you were able to forgive it. Now, no matter what happens, you just smile. You realize the whole damn thing's a joke. And that's it. The world but gives rise to defensiveness. For threat brings anger. And so it's in the loop. And then righteous and self-defense. Self Yet is defensiveness a double threat? For it attests to weakness. So why are they attacking me? They must think I'm weak or I must be weak. And it sets up a system of defense that cannot work. So then I believe I'm weak. If someone's going to attack me, now I need to gun up. I need to get the bigger weapon. And they'll get bigger weapons. And then you get bigger weapons. And bigger weapons. Next, next thing you're nuking each other. Now are the weak still further undermined? Why? Because we undermine ourselves. We start to play out these stories in our heads when we're alone. We feel incensed and hurt. And then we attack people in our heads. And then you wonder why you get in the car and the traffic's horrible. Because you created the war. I used to do that. I used to leave the house and like angry just at the thoughts of the war and the injustices in my life as a young boy. By the time I got in the car, the traffic was horrendous. And the amount of boxing matches I got into traffic were innumerable. Man, and then you had skills. And then next thing you know, you're panel beating someone. And then there's lawyers involved. And even then, but they attacked me first. Well, it doesn't matter. You should have known better. And that was the cycle of my life. And once forgiveness came, traffic became a blessing. I'm telling you the story, not to tell you my story, because that's irrelevant, but to really drive home a point that if it could happen to a person who was so angry and built his entire life around defense, hell, my nickname was Batman. I had the suit, the armor, the standoffish. No one was allowed to hug me. I was always ready for war. Always, I mean, I wouldn't even wear sandals because you can't fight in sandals. You know, the boots were always riding next to the bed. The gun was next to the, the, the bedside table. You know, um, alarms were set, motion sensors around. I was expecting attack all the time. And today I sleep like a baby without any of this. Traffic becomes a meditation. Forget about all the spiritual mumbo jumbo, non-duality, course in miracles, awakening. Forget about it. This is a lesson that makes your life easier. And it works. Take it from someone who was on a downward spiral to turn into another Dexter. I, I was gearing up to be Dexter number two. I was going to make Dexter look like an amateur because of all the woo-woo psychic ability stuff. Never catch me. So thank God for the grace of forgiveness. Well, defensiveness is a double threat. For it attests to weakness and sets up a system of defense that cannot work. Now are the weak still further undermined. For there is treachery without, everywhere, and still a greater treachery within because we deceive ourselves and because we believe the deceptions, the world responds with our belief. 
And now the mind is confused. Why is this happening to me? And knows not where to turn to find escape from its imaginings. And I meet many of my Christian friends and they've given their life to Jesus and of course the miracles have given their life to Jesus and they love Jesus. They become reborn because they believe in the hereafter and Jesus saves. But the attacks still come. Why are the attacks still coming? They believe in Christ. Oh, because God has a plan. God would never send harm your way. You're creating it with every thought you have, every defense you put up. And when you attack the rest of the world by judging it as not good enough and unworthy because you've decided what is good in God's view, and now you judge the world based on what you believe God judges the world, which is preposterous. Love cannot judge. It's unconditional. What happens? You attract the very judgment that you have. And the more aggressively you judge and the more aggressively you hate, the more aggressive the attacks are on you. It's as if, it's as if a circle held it fast. We're in another circle bound and another, another one in that until escape. Houdini could not escape this. No longer could be hoped for nor obtained. Because the mind's now confused. There's no idea what's going on. Why is this happening to me? Why do, you know, this book's written, why does bad things happen to good people? Because good people still have attack thoughts and believe the world's attacking them. So they set up defenses. They become rigid. And you see these people when they come old, they're physically rigid and they're bitter and they're twisted and they're vicious. And when they're younger, they just attack and they push people down and they make people feel like shit, especially leaders of organizations, constantly pushing people down. Instead of saying, how can I help you? How can I serve you? Conscientious leadership means how do I serve you? Not how do you serve me? If companies haven't figured out, leaders haven't figured out that the only way a company grows is as when the leader says, how do I serve my team? How do I serve their peace of mind? How do I serve their inspiration? Not how to beat them down every time they fuck up. Because they're going to fuck up according to you because you're perfect everybody else is flawed people in your organizations in your communities in your family when they're struggling they're not there for you to beat on them they're there for you to lift them this world you just see so many articles there's more articles that you can count on narcissists this organization is narcissistic that team's narcissistic this is negative that's toxic 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 hey have you not heard it takes one to know one if you're attracting narcissistic, toxic people into your life, dude, you're a narcissist. Face it. Accept it. Now, you may not be an outward narcissist, but you're an inner narcissist. You attack yourself. And then the narcissists are attracted. So if you're attracting narcissistic, toxic people, something inside there is toxic. Something inside you is narcissistic. Well, the dream is narcissistic because it created a dream where it beats itself up, a dream of fears and guilt, and it trapped itself in its own dream. What's more narcissistic than the dreaming ego body mind? Oh, there's so many narcissists in the world. The entire fucking world's narcissists. All of them. Even the guru who awakens to self is a narcissist until his final breath. Why? Because the ego is still attacking. It doesn't stop. You don't enlighten. Enlightenment is such a bullshit term. It means you awaken to self, the self-same essence you are. You realize the energy, the silence within is the truth of you. And that's the closest you'll get to truth. And so we're all, 8 billion of us, narcissists of varying degree. And if you're attracting them, it takes one to get to know one. And teachers for God, light of the world, where do you think? the messengers get sent? Where do the angels get sent? Not to where it's wonderful, classical music and everybody's happy. It gets sent to where people are struggling. It gets sent to the darkest parts of the earth. Why are you there? To realize the light you are and to light up and dissolve the shadows around you, to bring healing to the narcissists, to bring healing to the toxic environments, not to run away from it. You think you're going to get away from it. Wherever you go, there you are. You know that. Arnold Schwarzenegger said that 33 years ago. Attack defense, attack defense, attack defense becomes the circles of the hours and the days that bind the mind in heavy bands of steel 
with iron overlaid, chained to it, returning, but to start again. You'll be back. Arnold Schwarzenegger again, 33 years ago. There seems to be no break, no ending in the ever tightening grip of the imprisonment upon the mind, the imprisonment of yourself by yourself. Defenses are the costliest of all prices which the ego would exact. In them lies madness in a form so grim that hope of sanity seems to be but an idle dream beyond possible. The sense of threat the world encourages is so much deeper and so far beyond the frenzy and the intensity of which you can conceive that you have no idea of all the devastation it has wrought in the name of God, in the name of religion, in the name of helping others. We go to another country to teach them about our God. And if it means we wipe them out in teaching them, so be it. Because our God is the only God and every religion claims that. How much devastation have been done by 